This video looks at the 1953 Derby race card, one of the most famous derbies of all time. And the headline in the Birmingham Sports Argus was a knight checks the queen. Regret with the 1952 Chesham Stakes. Tory victory is clearly named after a Conservative general election victory of a few years earlier, and VC is clearly named after Victoria Cross, but will not be allowable to name now as horse names of just initials are no longer allowed. For example, 1956 Grand National winner ESB, who won when Devon Locks flipped up, would not be a legal name now. The winner of the first race was Ash Horse Wonder, winning at 20 to 1 and owned by R. Merrick, a haulage contractor from Southampton. This was the only horse he owned. The twin R. Sturdy is Richmond Sturdy, and the jockey was a then apprentice, Derek William Morris. He was really busy as a two-year-old in 1952, winning 11 times, but was only placed once. He made his debut run and placed at Windsor on April the 9th, and his placed effort was a third at Ripon in May. He won seven times in 1953, and as well as winning at Epsom, he won at Worcester in May, which at that point still had flat and jumps racing. His other five efforts were unplaced. He won ten times in 1954 with one win and some placed. He was now twinned by Les Hall. And Mr. Mate wanted one thing at that time, which was to enter the Stewards' Cup. Although the horse only had one win, it was one of the major flat handicaps of the year, as indeed he did win the Stewart's Cup at 50 to 1 at Glorious Goodwood in July, with a crazy sounding weight in those days, a fish of 6 stone 2, of the actually carried 6 stone 11 when ridden by Tucky Tony Shrive. The mirror reported that a sudden gale had affected the horses, horses who finished second and third in a close finish, and in fact the mirror wrote three years later. Of a second horse, a Midnight Express, had been blown almost and uh, sideways and had been unlucky. His placed efforts were second at Nottingham and at Doncaster, both earlier in July, third of four in the Welsh Stewards' Cup at Chepstow, and a third at Salisbury, with both races taking place in August. He was even busier in 1955, running in 12 races but didn't win any of them. His placed efforts were third of four at uh, Warwick in May. Fourth at Kempton in June and second at Leicester in September. He won six times in 1956, winning at Yarmouth in July and finishing fourth at Worcester in September. The second race was won by Dahlia. Another um, mare called Dahlia was even more famous, a top quality mare of the early 70s, who twice won the King George and Queen Elizabeth stakes at, at Ascot and then finishing third which behind uh, Grunde Bastien and what's known as the race of the century in 1975 and also two wins in the National Stakes at York. That is another day of a mare dahlia. This one is, is, was not, to be not quite as good but did win races. It was owned by one legend in Dolphy Paget, trained by another legend is Fulk Warren and written by a third legend in the form of Sir Gordon Richards. I won't talk about the legendary Fulk Warren here, there's no point in me reinventing the wheel. Our link comments have put up an interview after down with Racing Post, did you have his riddle calf, and also Wikipedia link, which frankly gives you all the information you need to know about Fulk Warwin. One of the main people connected with Dolphy Padgett in horse racing was Herbert Frenchy Nicholson, and he got called Frenchy because uh, when he was a young lad, he'd been working in France and brought back a French coat with him, and so therefore got a lifelong nickname of Frenchy Nicholson. 
and his son, possibly even more well known, is in, in the Duke, that's David Nicholson. I'll actually quote from the Duke's autobiography called The Duke, which he did with uh, journalist Jonathan Powell. His comments about Geoffrey Paget are a little outspoken, but that, frankly, is the best knowledge of how the Duke was in real life anyway. In June 1953, my father was sent to horses by Geoffrey Paget. Soon three more arrived from her previous trainer, Fulk Robin. Father, of course, had ridden Golden Miller a few times for her, but it was Dave Dick who suggested she sent the horses to Presbury. The first two were pretty moderate, but gradually, over the next five years, my parents ended up with nearly all of her jumps horses. Dorothy Paget lived at Shelford St Giles in Buckinghamshire and was a cousin of Jock Whitney, who owned the dual gold cup and the Easter hero. She was an owner of such a limited means that she made many of us of our landed gentry seem like small holders. And for a few eventful years, her team of horses dominated my parents' life. At one stage, they had 30 of her horses in training or out to grass. They stretched their resources to the limit, since there was never more than 25 boxes at uh, Lake House. Luckily, we were able to use some of the spare facilities in John Roberts' yard nearby. Miss Paget had a shocking reputation for being selfish, indecisive and bullying her trainers. She liked nothing more than ringing them up in the middle of the night. If you believe half the stories on the race course, she had become so antisocial that she was impossible for any trainer to handle. She was a large, obese woman with a gargantuan appetite and was also a diabetic, did not trust racehorse catering and preferred to take her own hampers of food. When she did appear in public, it was invariably an old, shapeless wooden overcoat and an ancient, unflattering blue hat. She certainly worked her way through a few trainers and a very public dispute with, with Basil Brasco when she moved Golden Miller elsewhere at the height of his fame. Dolphy Paget was one of those people who operated best at night. She tends to sleep through the day and come alive after dark. This is not welcome news for my father, who liked to be tucked up in bed every evening when he returned home from the pub. He knew the habit of ringing her trainers late at night and sensibly refused to install a telephone extension in his bedroom. On a few occasions she ventured out to the races at Windsor, or with big festival meetings, father always made a point of leaving for the last race, to go home to feed the horses. For Dorothy Paget, backing horses was an obsession. Gambling ruled her life. She bet fortunes, and though she hated losing, the vast fortune she left behind her in the ring became part of racing legend. She also hated the idea of selling horses in case they won for someone else. Most of all, she could not bear to see one of her horses winning if she had not backed it. She had to be pretty sure they only ran when they had a good chance or no chance at all. This called no end of it with my mother. Every time we had a pageant runner, expected to go through the form of every horse in the race and comment on their chances in percentage terms. But an outstanding chance, that was assessed as Banco. Then you knew Mrs. Miss Paget would have a massive punt. My parents sensibly did not want to know how huge sums were involved, but those closest to her often hinted that her standard bank or bet was £10,000. I was cutting that, of course, is £10,000 in those days. That was quite a stoking amount of money in the late 50s. The horse was considered unbeatable. She was in the habit of describing it as a double banco. Then she would put £20,000 in one go. Dr. Paget shouted at once when her bets lost, I expect that all her bookies just threw the same when she won. Every fancy runner had to be described in percentage terms of Banco. Sometimes it would take more than two hours to complete her homework on her race. Even before they ran, she would be required to ring Miss Paget's secretary, Miss Williams, with her views. So the secretary had, had a Christian name, but never knew what it was. Every conversation with her was recorded. In addition, my mother had to ring up again when she reached a race course to report on the prevailing conditions. Despite Dorothy Paget's strange behaviour, there is no doubt she was very fond of her horses. She was proud of them all, but not in the habit of visiting her trainers, and often represented at the, the races by her friend Sir Francis Cassell, a gifted pianist. Everything was black and white in her eyes. There were no grey areas. She needed to, told her once her horse needed soft ground, then she believed it always wanted soft. Parents found thus many stories about Dorothy Paget thoroughly misleading. 
which he proved to be a surprisingly good and exceptionally generous owner. No one in the family would say allow a word against her. She never failed to remember people's birthdays, sent Christmas boxes for all the family and lads, and would arrange tickets for Wimbledon or for the International Horse Show at the White City. She also organised a charity horse show in Prestbury with my friend Sam Wilson, and she donated all the prizes in the name of Golden Miller. The wealthy pageant was over Georgia, my father trained three winners for her, straight lad, Prince of Denmark and Primate at Newbury on December 30th, 1955. After Primate won the last race, she did her best to steer father towards a bar for an end of year celebration, but as usual he made excuses that he had to be off home to look after his other horses. When he drove his father's Crickdale and then, and, and then and, and, and mounted that we would after all have a celebration, as he pulled in outside a cafe. That day he treated all to tea and donuts. The Shields Daily News, reporting on the day of Dahlia's debut at Windsor on 13th April 1953, that the filly, plus four other horses, were Dorothy Padgett's latest arrivals from Ireland to be trained by Fulk Warwin. The Sporting Chronicle simply reports Dahlia made all in winning at Windsor. There's a great story in the Eve, Coventry Even Telegraph about the preceding race of Dahlia's win at Windsor, stating that the race was delayed because War Lee continued buck, jumped, and ran off into the woods as the race started. And we also said that, that uh, War Lee was Gordon Richard's 80th win at Windsor since the end of World War II, at 16 more than his nearest rival. Paper states that Dahlia herself won her debut easily by 11 and a half. Was Dorothy Paget present to see her two winners that day? The Sunderland and Daily Echo and Shipping Gazette had a headline that, that day that Dahlia won in finer style. Dahlia won again as in her next race at Epsom, this time in April. McNabb uh, writing there that uh, Dorothy Paget had a winning £1,000 a bet. That's equivalent of about, about £25,000 these days. She then won at Chester's May meeting. Cheshire Observer reported on a fine furlong race. She set a cracking pace and had a runaway lead of several lengths before finishing third. After winning an Epsom in, on the day we are looking at, a final career race was at the old Folkestone Way course in August, where despite the services of against Sir Gordon Richard and starting at 92 on favoured, she failed to beat her only opponent. She never won out as a three-year-old horse. Hocker Money over 1955 Air Gold Cup. In 1953, High Treason won the Chesham Stakes at Ascot as the first two-year-old to win the non-fop stakes. There are a few Group 1 races where two-year-olds can enter, unless they are solely restricted to two-year-olds, and one of these is the non-fop stakes at York. Rose Ferry finished third in 1954,000 guineas at the Newmarket Rolly Mark Oil with a 1953 link through Derby trial and Cumberland Lord Stakes, with a 1954 Coronation Cup Hardwood Stakes, and King George VI and Queen Elizabeth stakes, the leading sign group Britain in 1960 and 61, and the sire St Paddy, St Crispin, Aurelius and Provoke. Good Brandy won the 1952 Newcastle season Delaval stakes, and the 1953 Newmarket free handicap at Rolly Mile course in April. Chatsworth won the 1954 and 55 Manchester Cup handicap, and the 1954 Kempton Park Great Jubilee handicap. The ruler the 1952 Middle Park Stakes, the 1953 First Classic Trial, the 2000 Guineas, the David Palace Stakes and the Champion Stakes, and the 1954 with the March Stakes and the Burrow Stakes. Chickampo with the 1953 Pre de Chante. And Charlemagne is ridden by Lester Pickett here, and interestingly, uh, he was ridden by Lester Pickett again in March 1954 when he won a triumph hurdle at Hurst Park, a race now held at Cheltenham Festival after Hurst Park closed. Ember Honey with a 1953 July Stakes on a new market July course. Victory World with a 1953 D Stakes at Chester's May meeting. Pinza was trained by Norman Bertie and owned by Victor Sassoon and ridden by Sir Gordon Richards. Pinza made his debut at the old Hurst Park race course in July 1952, finishing fifth. He then won at Doncaster on the Thursday of the St. Ledger meeting in September, where the Sporting Chronicle says he won easily. In the same month, he went on to finish second in the Royal Lord Stakes at Ascot. He finished his two-year-old season with winning the Dewhurst Stakes at Newmarket Rolling Mile course in October. 
he missed the 2000 guineas due to an injury and made his three year old debut in the new market stakes uh, back at the World in Mile course in May as three to one second favourite. But, but, but won that day. The Sporting Chronicle reports he he was winning in a canter. He went off joint five to one favourite foot for the Derby. The Sporting Chronicle says he'll run, run easily, and I'll come back to the Derby in a minute. He ended his career with a win of a King George VI and Queen Elizabeth, Elizabeth Stace at Ascot. And if you ever see Queen Elizabeth listed listed in an old race card as an owner, it isn't for Queen. It's always listed as well, so I should be the Queen. Queen Elizabeth always means, as it does in this race title, Queen Elizabeth, the Queen and Mother. Interesting, the previous race to the King George that day was run by the two-year-old colt, Never Say Die, who the next year gave a very young Leicester Pickett the first of his nine Derby wins. So back to the Derby. The 49-year-old Gordon Richards had won just about everything as a flat jockey bar for Derby, having lost it 27 times. In recent times, Frankie de Tory winning his first derby or ATP McCoy winning the Grand National with major stories, but there's no doubt that these were dwarfed by Gordon Richards winning the 1953 derby. He became the only current jockey to be knighted five days earlier. The only other jockey to be knighted is a certain Anthony Peter McCoy, who I just talked about, but he was knighted a year after retiring. The other horse racing knights in history are trainer Jack Darvis, trainer Cecil Boyd Washford and his stepson Henry Cecil, and tra- trainer Noel Merlis, and the other one went to commentator and journalist Peter O'Sullivan. Lester Pickett might have got one if he hadn't been serving Her Majesty's pleasure in another way. Of current trainer Sir Michael Stout's knighthood is actually from Barbados for tourism where he grew up until he was about 18 and Sir Mark Prescott's knighthood is, in, is inherited as, is, as he is actually a baronet. On the day of the derby, the Daily Mirror front page headlined of, of a Queen versus Sir Gordon while in slide the paper newsboy's headline was Come on Gordon, you can do it. The Newcastle Journal stated that if it can't be the Queen, let's hope it's Gordon. 1953 was a coronation year of a queen, so it added interest to the race, especially as her Oriole horse was one of the favourites for the race. The day before the derby, the Aberdeen Evening Express stated that if either Pinza or the Queen's Oriole won Epsom Downs, would have, would have scenes never seen before. The Seals Daily News the day before the race said a record crowd would have ex- expected, and the Liverpool Echo wrote that the two horses would see sentimental gambles. Day of the race, the Yorkshire Post said that two of the most popular cries in the race course at the time were Hats off to the Queen and Come on Gordon. The Hartlepool Daily Mail said that most people, people wanted the Queen to win, but if she couldn't then they wanted Sir Gordon to win. And after he won, the Yorkshire Post said there were scenes of indescribable enthusiasm. The Liberal Echo reported that when Sir Gordon sat down to weigh in in the weighing room, spontaneous cheers forward from those present which no one could ha- remember happening before. Headline in the Birmingham Sports Argus was, and Knight checks for Queen. So he said that the crowd had, had hoped to cheer a royal winner, but their, their second best wish had been granted. They woke with a record crowd started with quite a disappointment as it became clear the Queen's Oriole was not going to win. The second and two gave way later on to deafening cheers for Gordon Richards. Crowds apart afterwards surged round the encycling enclosure. The Queen of the Royal Box clapping Gordon Richards and inviting him and trainer Norman Bertie up to see her. She so congratulated them on winning the Derby, where Norman Bertie, the trainer, congratulated her on winning the world. So Gordon was then besieged by reporters and admirers when he went out to a ride later on, and Sir Gordon gave a short message over the radio. The, the newspaper article actually says wireless, but, as it would do in those days, saying... I am so excited and dazed that I hardly know how I have won yet. Pinzer is a wonderful horse. Bookmaker Douglas Stewart said he was delighted to pay out on one of the biggest payouts for 50 years as the result was great for racing. For the 1953 Blue Ribbon Trial Stakes, the Great Volta Stakes at York and the St Ledger, which is qualified from first place in the 1953 Irish Derby for causing interference and won the 1954 Yorkshire Cup. Scipio, who was certainly named after the Scipio family of ancient Rome, won the 1953 Lanark Silver Bell 
It is now one of Hamilton since the Lambert West was closed. King of the Tudors of the 1953 Sussex Stakes and the 1954 Eclipse Stakes. Dante's current name comes from being Sarah being Dante, and both are connected with, with medieval literature. Eucalyst, who was the fourth race, was trained by Noel Cannon and owned by John Arthur Dewar, who had owned horses including Cameroonian, who won over 1931 2000 Guineas in Derby. He also bred and owned 2000 Guineas winner Tudor Minstrel. He had inherited a million pounds, which is worth about £46 million pounds now, and horses from his uncle, and when he won the Derby of Cameroonian, he gave a nickname Lucky Dewar. Pugilist was ridden by the jockey Arthur Edward Briefly from Australia, but always known as Scobie Briefly, was champion jockey in Britain four times and won the Epsom Derby when aged 50 and 52 in the 1960s, and the jockey, trainer and owner also combined to win the 1954,000 guineas with Festoon, although Lucky Dewar's luck ran out a few months later when he died in Italy. Gobi Breezley had returned to Australia in 1952 after a fallout with an owner, but Dewar had convinced him to return to Britain in 1953. In 1953, Poodlist ran eight times at Epsom being his only win. He finished fourth in his debut at Sandow in April with Temple Gate and the Daily Herald feeling he had shown some promise. He was then second at Salisbury in May, and after winning at Epsom, where the Aberdeen Evening Express felt he had won easily, he was third at Salisbury in July, was then again third at Doncaster's Legend meeting in September, and described later in September the game at Colt in the Western Mail. He won five times in 1954 without winning, finishing second at Newbury in May. The Daily Mirror fancying him has its own promise earlier at Sandown. He also finished second at Salisbury in May and fourth at Salisbury in August. Infatuation with the 1953 Warlord Stakes and Dewar Stakes and with the 1954 Greenham Stakes. Olin did with the 1953 Craven Stakes at Newmarket and was third in the 2000 Guineas. Arctic Slaves the Sire of the Dam of a wonderful 80s mare with the only horse ever to win the Champion Hoodle and the Gold Cup, Dawn won. Kiefer, who won this race, was trained by Fred Armstrong and ridden by Willie Snaith. He didn't run as a two-year-old and made his debut as a three-year-old for winning at the Newmarket Royal in Mile Craven meeting in April as one of ten runs of that season, as his breeding race card suggests he came from France. He was the first one in England for his owner, Sir Donatus Victoria, a centre in Sri Lanka. He was third at Pontefract later in April and at the Old Alexander race course in May. He then ran at Epsom. However, in those days, until it was changed on March 20th, 1961, there were no overnight declarances, so nobody could be sure who was running, and even if a winner was in the race card. Keith had been originally intended to win in the Derby, who was predicted to be 200-1, to 1, and actually appears in the race card among the entrants for that race, as, as well as appearing in the race card for this race. The paper sometimes had to make the best guess as to who was running in a race, and the Daily Herald, the Newcastle Journal, the Birmingham Daily Gazette, the Nottingham Journal, the Yorkshire Post and the Daily Mirror had all had him listed in the Derby and only had three runners for this race instead of the actual four runners and I expect all the other papers probably said the same thing as well. Pretty much the public wanted overnight declarances, the racing establishment didn't. Until 1957 the Coventry Evening Telegraph reported the Race Course Owners Association as opposing them they introduced in Ireland in 1930 and ordering by then compulsory on the continent and in Australia. After winning at Epsom, he was second at the old Stockton race course in July before winning at Doncaster later in the month. In August, he was third at Brighton and then fourth in September at the Newmarket Royal Mile course. He came to the Royal Mile course in October, had been seen as his, as his main target by some racing correspondents. And in the weeks leading up to the race, were uh, many reports of bets being made on the horse, making one of the favourites, and some journalists fancied him for the race, and he went off Coford's favourite at 100 to 8. Newsboy in the mirror, though, gave a post-mortem. My help, Kiffer, was never seen with a chance. The weekly newspaper, The Spear, blamed a very soft going, however, he went on to win at the old Manchester race course in November. In 1954, he won again 10 times, winning once, been second in Sandown in May before winning at Lingfield in June. He finished third at Newcastle in July, fourth at Ripon in August, 
3rd at air in September 4th, at Newmarket Royal in Mile Course in October, and having missed the November handicap, which in those days was one at Manchester when it had a race course, rather than at Doncaster, as it is now, he finished second of the Liverpool Autumn Cup of a flat course that Aintree used to have. Diamond won the 1953 City and Suburban Handicap at Epsom. No home and finished second in the 1952 Champion Hurdle to the brilliant Sir Ken. Glenny won this race, trained by Jack Warren, ridden by S. Clayton, made his debut in 1948, finishing third at Wally Mile Course on the 6th of October, having been an on-runner on the same course on October 1st. He also finished second at Manchester Race Course, November 2nd, 5-4 favourite, in April 1949, he, he won twice, finishing second at World in Mile Course, before winning Epsom's Blue Ribbon Trial Stakes, in which those days was run over one mile and a half a furlong. He'd been napped in the day he held by the Newmarket correspondent due to his improved condition and style. However, Temple gets him the same paper, felt he hadn't got the mile at Newmarket and might be top class at six furlongs. When he was afterwards caught at 33 and 40 to 1 for the 2000 guineas, and Jay Barrington, his breeder, who at that point owned the horse, said he felt he had to win the horse given how well he'd run at Epsom. When he finished sixth in the 2000 Guineas at 40 to 1, he then ran in the Derby and was the only entrant who had won at Epsom before. However, Epsom form has been pretty irrelevant for the Derby for at least the last 30 years. And given the last horse to win the Derby after winning the Blue Ribbon Trial Stakes was Blue Peter in 1939, it was probably losing its relevance then as well. He's up for the pace for the first half of the race before finishing unplaced. In September, Penslow, writing the Liverpool Echo, fancied him for the Cambridgeshire, as he felt Granny was not overburdened with weight. However, next month, Mr Barrington said the horse had become injured and would miss the race. In late December, he was caught at 25 to 1 for next March's Lincolnshire Handicap, then still won at the old Lincoln race course. The name was renamed as the Lincoln Handicap, when it transferred to Doncaster in 1965, when Lincoln closed. And it used to generate a lot more anti post interest in the 1960s than it does nowadays. But Nottingham Evening Post said on 10th Jan 1950, that one or two big bets have been stuck for granny for the Lincolnshire Handicap. He's now owned by his current owner, G.C. Vanderbel, who bought him privately from Barrington after the horse failed to meet his reserve price at Newmarket Autumn 1949 sales. It appears that the new owner's name was actually Charles of Andeville. Granny was well beaten in March's Lincolnshire Handicap, finished 16th at 40 to 1, before surprising when the new market spring cup at 20 to 1 in April, giving Mr. Vanderville his first success as an owner. He was busy that season, winning a total of 10 times, and although won some decent races, he only had that win at Newbury. He finished second at Bath later in April, third at Kempton in June. Fourth in the Markets July course in June, fourth in Chesterfield Cup at Cloris Goodwood in July, and second at Brighton in August. 1951, he won eight times on the flat by the 22nd of September with much more success. Started in April, finishing midfield in Kempton's Rosebury Stakes. Later the same month, he finished fourth at Nottingham and third at the Old Hurst Park Racecourse. He then won at Epsom in June on Oaks Day, won again in August at Goodwood, winning the Chesterfield Cup race. He'd been fourth in the year before. And later in August, he won the Farm of Handicap on Eber Day at York, and he suffered a couple of defeats October onwards. In 1952, he won 10 times in flat season. Started the season a winner of a Liverpool Speed Cup Handicap at Aintree, the day before Grand National. He then finished third on May the 17th at Newmarket World in Mile Course. I wanted to leave the race before the card was called the April 5th Handicap, but was named after the 1952 winner of a derby of that name. He then finished third of four at Epsom on Derby Day in June, but he was on place on his following seven runs of that year. In 1953, he won seven times from a flat and won one other race as well as the race card I'm looking at today. He won at Windsor in April in the same meeting where Daly, who I spoke about earlier, made her winning debut. And McNabb and Daly Herald said he won the utmost ease, but that the form was unreliable. In 1954, he won eight times in that year, with, with no, but with no wins. His only race of note was since his second at Worcester in April. It appears not to have run after 1954, although there was one piece of drama. On the evening of May the 6th, Charles Vandervoort suffered a burglary and his Newmarket Spring Cup and Chesterfield Cup trophies were stolen. And 
simply noting the racehorse Merlin because I happen to like the mythological character Merlin. Racehorse Magic Circle is clearly named after the Magician Society and a much more recent horse Magic Circle is still running and there's Omar Man Kukash and has won major handicaps including the Chester Cup. You might be wondering what the strange looking great metropolitan course is if you know the current race because it bears absolutely no relation to it whatsoever. This is how the race was actually won until 1985. Until those days, Epsom couldn't actually close off the centre of the course. And so they decided to run the race literally through the race course. I'll put in a link in the comments. Actually, a path and news reel of the race is absolutely fascinating. Do possess a no, race card from the April meeting, which actually uh, has, of course, its old distance. So I think it's two miles, two furlongs. And I'll put that up at some point in the future. But it's, a it's a fascinating race. And in a way, I wish it was still one like that. But of course, the issue Epsom would have had is you could get a lot less people into the race course when you've actually got a race running for the middle of it. And that's basically, I suspect, why they stopped running a race like that was just because they get more crowds in.